fascism, socialism, and communism. And you know, people don't like to use those words, but those are the definitions of specific economic systems. To have those economic systems, fascism, socialism, and communism, will they naturally arise? No. Never happen. What do I have to do to make them happen? Pass laws. I have to pass laws to get these. I will never get these without passing laws. Even the Plymouth Bay Company. You guys know about the Plymouth Bay Company, right? No. Plymouth Bay Company. If you read William Bradford's, I, I advise it. I used to read it to my kids every Thanksgiving. William Bradford's autobiography or his journal is about the Plymouth Bay Company. The Plymouth Bay Company was set up. They believe they were setting themselves up like the, uh, the, new, the Jerusalem church in Acts, which they're wrong because they didn't know Greek. But that's part of the problem with the modern era. People stop learning their Greek and they start reading English translations or, or German translations and that's the problem. But they believed they were setting up, the Plymouth Bay Company set up their company and had regulations, not by law per se, they were laws, they ended up being laws, but they were a compact and everybody agreed to it and basically it was socialism. That everyone would own the commons, everyone would own everything in common and have no private property. And guess what happened the first two years? They starved to death. William Bradford, in his journal, what is the story of Thanksgiving? Does anybody know what the real story of Thanksgiving is? The real story of Thanksgiving is when the new, when the next group came in, like in the second, in the first year, the ne end of the first year, the second group of, of colonists came in. They had a problem. They had not signed for the compact, and William Bradford didn't know what to do with them. So what William Bradford did for the new guys that came in is he gave them private tracts of land. And guess what they started doing? Farming. Producing enormous amounts of food. The other tracts of land, no one worked. Why? They didn't know it. it was shared in common. They had no incentive to work. And so guess what William Bradford did in the second year of the colony? Gave everybody. Gave everybody their private property and retained the Boston Commons, which is still trash today, <laughs> to the people. So guess what saved the Plymouth Bay Colony? It wasn't Squanto. It wasn't the Indians. The Indians were like sub, sub Stone Age culture. Do you think they knew anything about agriculture no. compared to the Europeans? No. No. They did not teach them how to grow corn by putting fish into a hole. That's, that's just myth, okay? The point is, they weren't even agrarian. They were barely agrarian. The point is this, that what saved the Plymouth Bay Colony was returning to capitalism. That is with private property. Because remember, to have capitalism, what do you have to have? Private property. And so what is a natural state? Private property in capitalism is natural. So that what they did is their compact put a legal control, which was socialistic and actually was communistic, over the Plymouth Bay colony. And they almost died. I make this statement all the time. Leftism, these things will kill you. Nazis? Mm -hmm. National Socialists? How about, well, you know, USSR is a socialist nation, but communism and socialism are hand in hand. They're this basically very similar forms. How many people died at the hands of the communists last million, century? Over 30 million. 100 million, well, 30 million in the USSR, about 100 million according to the Black in Book China. of Communism in China and all the other countries. And China still kills them for fun and profit. So. You know, the thing is that what we have to realize is these, these economic systems are, are imposed. Why does the government impose these systems? Because why? What can I control? Money. I control the people. In a fascist system, I use regulation and control business. Therefore, I control business and private property, right? In a socialist system, I own it. Therefore, I control it. In a communist system, so the point of these systems is the control of the governed. The control of the governed, the people. If I control your resources, I control what? And remember, okay, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And remember what I told the Federalist Papers tells us the pursuit of happiness was? Owning property. You'd be able to dispose of your property as you wish. Life is a pretty important piece of property, isn't it? 
It is to me. I don't know about you, but my life is important property to me, my own. Liberty is important. Let me talk about this for a second. Um, can the government protect your life? Yes. Up to a point. Do you know what he said? He can try to. He's absolutely right. Because somebody, even though Ronald Reagan or JFK were surrounded by Secret Service guys. They killed JFK. They killed, uh, what's his name? Um, Martin Luther King. Well, he didn't have a whole bunch of security guys around him. But you look at presidents. Presidents have been assassinated even though they were surrounded by it. So can, can the government protect your life? No, not really. No, it can't. It can try. I mean, that's why have police officers and such, but they can't. And, it, you know, even if somebody's threatening you, you know, unless they're really threatening you and you call the police and say, hey, could you help me? You know, I hope the police will come, but sometimes, you know, they're even busy with other stuff, right? How about liberty? Can the government protect your liberty? It should. Can they, though? Probably depends on what you call liberty. Well, let's say just, well, has anybody ever been kidnapped in this country? Oh, yeah. <laughs> then can they protect your liberty? If they want to kidnap you, then kidnap you, right? Doesn't matter what you do. You know, you could put a, a, if you could put a security detail around people, you know, even your liberty is in, can be infringed. But can the government protect your private property? Yes. The government can always protect your private property. For example, let's say you lose your life. Can the private property still be owned by you and your descendants? Yes. Yeah. How about if you lose your liberty? Does that mean you lose your property? As a matter of fact, in the Constitution, these are called out specifically, aren't they? Mm -hmm. In other words, the government can't confiscate, uh, can't confiscate your property because you are, you know, just because you are accused of a crime, right? Even a criminal who commits murder, the government can't just take your property, even if the government takes your life, right? Let's look at this a little bit in a little more, uh, another case. Let's look at... All right, don't laugh. I'm trying to draw a slightly, okay, this is kind of the country, right? Right, kind of the country. Okay, all right. Now it looks like a side of you. It must be just the red side. All right, Miss Texas, Miss Texas, got Texas. All right, okay, what, what is inside of this? States. States, I got a bunch of states, right? A bunch of states, 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 okay? Now, federal government. What is the purpose of the federal government? Protect your borders. Okay. Well, the ultimate provable purpose of government is to protect, protect private, private property. property. Okay, that's in the Constitution, right? But what you said is all right. So the purpose of the government is to protect the borders because why? Well, because we own that. This is what we claim to own, and this is privately owned, uh, well, it was. At the turn of the century, 5% was owned uh, by the government, and now about 20% of the land mass in the United States is owned by the government, which means it's not all private property anymore. And plus, because of my court case, you guys don't really own private property, but that's another <laughs> issue. But the purpose of government is to protect your private property. So if, for example, and this happened, right, the Mexican army came across the border of Texas, and did what? Killed American citizens. The government couldn't protect them, right? Took some of them, kidnapped them, right? Women and children. But guess what? Who still owned the property? The citizens. Even though Mexico made claims, and still has claims, against Texas, by the way. There's still legal claims against Texas by the Mexican government. But guess who retains control? The people. The, the people of the United States, right? Mm -hmm. The private citizens. So you got to get this. In the Constitution of the United States, and I gave you a copy of the of part of the Constitution that said what the government is allowed to spend money on and do. One of the main things they're allowed to do is have a army, army and navy. The army and navy. You have an army and a navy. The army protects what? Land. And the navy protects what? Water. 
What are they supposed to protect? Borders. Oh. Waters. Now, who do we have on our border right now? Canada. Huh? Mexico. Ice. Ice. Is ice military? Yeah, uh, what is ice? Immigration. Immigration, control. control, whatever. Immigration, customs. Customs. I'm, I'm not trying to knock them down. I'm just saying, in the Constitution, who's supposed to protect the borders? The Army. And the the Army. Army and the Navy. And what do you do if, if a bad guy comes across? Well, you either take them into custody if they don't resist, or you shoot them. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, this should answer every question for you that there is about, for example, illegal immigration. The problem is that who now protects our borders? Nobody. Really. I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> I don't know who's protecting our borders. No one really. <laughs> that fence never got built. Well, I don't care if fence. It doesn't say in the Constitution build a fence. It says what? You have what? Army. Army and Navy. And I guarantee if there's Army troops standing across the border with a gun like this and say, who are you? <laughs> right? Seems to work at Guantanamo pretty well. It, yeah, it works at Guantanamo pretty well. Yeah. You know, it works I, in other countries very well. Other countries have that. Mexico does that, yes. Mexico has troops along their border because in Mexico they don't have ICE or immigration that protects their borders. Who protects the borders of Mexico? The Army. The Mexican Army. Who protects the borders of, uh, of, this, of the ex-Soviet Union, the Russian? The army. The army. Who protects the borders of Germany? The army. The army. Who protects the borders of France? The army. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the purpose of government? Protect. Now, within this federal, you have states. Uh, okay, Kansas. Kansas is easy to draw. You know, it's like a record. So here's Kansas. Who protects the borders of Kansas? Nobody. <laughs> well, actually, we do have people that are supposed to protect the borders the of Kansas. Highway Patrol. Yeah, there's a wait station for some of the truckers. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There are. There really is. We have an Air National Guard. We have a National Guard. Yeah. Right? National Guard. We also have federal troops posted in the state. But, you know, the original reason for the Guard, National Guard, was to do what? Protect the borders of the Protect the border of the state. Yeah. The, the purpose of the police is not to protect the state. That is, the private, you know, they do protect the private property within the state, that is, stealing and things like that. But their ultimate purpose isn't that, right? They're not there to protect the borders. What do the police do? Police have a very important service. They protect the people. They try to protect life and liberty, and they also try to protect private property, but their job is within the state, right? They're not trying to protect us from Arkansas. You see how we've gotten this kind of, you know, a lot of this comes from our cultural thinking, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of it comes from, uh, well, why, why would the government have, you know, we have over 40 agencies that carry guns around here. That's a great question. You know, that is not a question that we could prove it historically. We can talk about it historically. Whether it's right or wrong is, is an issue of ethics. But why did it happen? Why did the FBI come about? Why did the CIA come about? FBI has a lot of roots in uh, murders in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, it's creation and prohibition. Uh, after pro during prohibition, Right, but quite a bit of was loyalties on oil in Osage County in Oklahoma, and quite a few murders resulted because of uh, the uh, arrangements for securing royalties on oil and other mineral rights in Oklahoma, just a little way south of here in Osage County, Oklahoma, in the 1920s. This is Dustin Austin's old recollection of uh, some of the beginnings of the FBI in Oklahoma history. Well, there's nobody looking from one state to another when there was a tie between them as we had to do. Nobody had authority to do that. Well, they did. And this is a problem. Okay, this is a very important thing. For example, Germany and France don't share the same police force. But if somebody commits a crime in France, what then does Germany do if it was a crime? It, 
legitimate crime. They're not Interpol. What do they do? Extradition. They extradite you. That's what happened in the States. What does it imply if there is a federal police force? They can do it. Well, more than that. States have the Usurp the authority of the state? Is usurp the authority of the state. This is, okay, you ask one, okay? What does the fact that I have an FBI, ATF, you know, uh, liquor, you know, alcohol control for the federal government, uh, name them, you know, National Police Department, ICE, Immigration Control? What is, it, what is that? It's a usurpation of the, of the control by the states, okay, by the federal government of the states. Which, by the way, all these things happened after what? <laughs> what was the great conflagration about states' rights? Civil War. Civil after the Civil War. You know, the Civil War did a great thing doing away with slavery, but it did a terrible thing by doing away with states' rights also. I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm not trying to make, I'm not trying to tell you that FBI is bad or good or ICE is good or bad. I'm just trying to tell you that what, why did we get here? What does it mean? You know, there are other ramifications. Let's talk about the other ramifications. Um, the other ramifications are, for example, uh, financial. Let's talk about financial. Um, I, I think I need to mention this. You guys ever heard of moral hazard? Mm -hmm. What is moral hazard? Anybody kind of, I've got a definition here, but can anybody give us a really easy explanation of moral hazard? Let, let me put, let, I, I'll read you the, the definition. It's a prospect that a party insulated from risk may behave differently from the way it would behave if it were fully exposed to risk. Moral hazard arises because an individual or institution does not bear the full consequences of its actions and therefore has a tendency to ask, act less carefully than it otherwise would, leaving another party to bear some responsibility for the consequences of those actions. For example, an individual with insurance against automobile theft may be less vigilant about locking his car because the negative consequences of the automobile theft are partially borne by the insurance company. So in other words, without moral hazard, people are willing to take risks they wouldn't otherwise consider. For example, what is the greatest, we've seen the greatest result of, of lack of moral hazard in our country recently. Anybody know what it was? Is. Was is. Borrowing money. Borrowing money, the banks. The bailouts. The bailouts. That is lack of moral hazard. Let them fail. Okay, that's that's a ethical opinion. All right, but we'll talk. We'll get into that. Why that's not necessarily as ethical as you think. But in any case, moral hazard means, for example, if you are unwilling to work to eat. You should no problem. Well, the Bible says don't work, don't eat. But in, if you don't have moral hazard, that means that if you won't work, <laughs> guess what? We'll feed you anyway. Well, what's with that? We'll give you Xbox too. And and drugs. And drugs, yes. Uh, you know, for example, methadone. You know, if, if you're a heroin addict, instead of getting you off, we'll give you methadone. So you can go to a methadone clinic and get, you know, doc, or... And additional pot. And, and additional supply. And, and a free supply. And medicinal pot. And medicinal pot. How's that? <laughs> I mean, you, you can fill the blanks any way you want, but without moral hazard, without the chance that a bank will fail, or the chance that you'll fail, right? You don't want to fail. But if what? The government says you won't fail, guess what happens? Plymouth Bay Colony. Right? And yet, what happened to Plymouth Bay Colony? Everyone failed. Right? That's the problem with moral hazard, with lack of moral hazard. If there's no moral hazard, that means everyone would fail, will fail. But in any case, let's talk about this a little bit. Governments can compel by force. So, for example, taxation is what? I compel you by force mm -hmm. to pay what I've determined is your fair share. Extortion. <laughs> well, some would call it theft and extortion, but you know, literally, I take a gun and put it against your head and say, if you don't pay this money, you will go to jail and take your property. I can take your life, liberty, and your property. Unless you're Geithner. Unless you're Timothy Geithner, yes. Um, <laughs> charities. Do charities compel by force? No. No. Uh, I, I think this is a really interesting figure. Last year, Americans spent over over $300 billion in charity in the, from the United States, in the United States, $300 billion. 
the federal budget is like around what? One point, uh, who knows what it is now, but 1.2 <laughs> or 4 <laughs> trillion, right? That's the low on the deficit. This is more than all the welfare programs of all the states and the federal government. Not, not if you include, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, Social Security. Those are like ginormously, ginormous. But 300 billion is more than almost every other nation in the world spends in charity or spends on welfare. In other words, in this country, private charity could take care of all the welfare yeah. needs in the whole country. It couldn't handle Social Security and Medicare, but it could handle that. The, thing, the, point, the reason I'm making this point is because charity is not compelled. In other words, as a charity organization, I don't come up to you and say, well, I guess Robin Hood did. You know, give me your money or I'll take your life. But yet the government can do that. They can use compel, they can use force to compel you to give money, your life, liberty, and your property, or else, right? Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, what do you do with that money? What is the only purpose that we could prove that government should use that money to do? Wait, the armed forces to protect our borders <coughs> and private property. Well, let's not, let's not say just the armed forces, but the answer is correct. Legitimately, okay, uh, this is not an opinion. Legitimately, the only purpose I can prove for taxation is what? To protect private to property. Protect like I, like I said, you can make laws to make anything else you want, right? I can compel people to do anything, right? Germany compelled people to kill Jews. In the United States, we compel people to have slaves, right? Until the Civil War. The big deal is you can compel people by law to do anything, but the only purpose I can prove for taxation is to protect private property. Now, the question is this. Why would the government have an interest in taking property that is taxation and using it for some other purpose. Control the people. Now, I will agree with that as a, that is a provable answer, but the, but you, it may not be clear how we got there. In our particular political system, it's made constituents happy so they vote for you. It's, it's where this argument would lead me is you make the people happy so they keep you in office. Which means you are doing what? Controlling. Controlling the people. Contra controlling the elected. And, and, and influencing. Influence well, you can put words on it any way you want. Influencing, extorting, <laughs> controlling, you know. Because the, the point is this. Why did the, why, okay, who first started this idea? Anybody have an idea? Who started this idea? The Romans. The Romans did. Okay, now there, there are other ancient governments that did certain similar things. But what did the Romans do to prevent a people? Red and circuses. That's exactly right. The way that the Romans discovered you can control people, and by the way, it was a Roman Republic, is by taxing the people so that I could provide bread and circuses to control others. Anybody know why Social Security exists? Who invented Social Security? No, he didn't. He took it from another person in America. You can see quotes of who he took it from. Otto von Bismarck. Otto von, matter of fact, if you go on the Social Security page, they used to have his picture on there. Otto von Bismarck is the inventor of Social Security. Why did Otto von Bismarck, a German, invent Social Security in the 18, I think it was the 1860s? 1860s. Why did he invent Social Security? You need to look up Otto von Bismarck. There are some very famous quotes from him. You're in the middle of the wars of German unification then. You're, you're, in, you're right in the middle of the wars of German unification in the middle 1800s. Otto von Bismarck's purpose with Social Security was so that the, he said this. This is, a, this is a paraphrase of a quote, but he basically said, if, if we promise the young some payment, when they get older, they won't revolt because they'll be paying in money with the expectation of being paid by the government on a government pension when they are older. If we pay the old, the aged, they will be less in, 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 uh, interested in revolting. 
because they will be paid by the government and they'll lose their pension or they'll lose the pay. Social Security was invented by Otto von Bismarck to control the people. Great German idea, right? Let's control the people. And Social Security was that invention. Matter of fact, like I said, go on the Social Security page and you'll find Otto von Bismarck's picture there, if they haven't taken it down, that it attributes it to him. Is there any documentation as to why he implemented it? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's huge quotes. You know, it's, it's a, there's treatises on it because his purpose was to control the electorate, to control the people. It wasn't an electorate then. It was a, it was a, uh, uh, a kingdom. There were kingdoms. They were, you know, the empire, the empire. But the point of Social Security was to control the people. Likewise, why did the FDR implement Social Security in this country? To help poor elderly people? No, it has nothing to do with helping people. <laughs> it was to control the people. Look, if you don't know anything, okay, look. <laughs> it, it, is, it could be your opinion that FDR was being nice or that Otto von Bismarck was being nice. It's easier to say Otto von Bismarck, a nasty German guy, you know, with the uh, empire builder, is a bad guy. Uh, we don't like to say that about FDR, although, you know, similar roots. The point is this. <laughs> what is the fact that I can prove about all government spending that does not protect private property? It's, it's, it's to control. control people. It's to control in one way or another, whether it's to buy votes, whether it is to, for example, provide a road. Now, a road's different. What does a road actually do? Just, what is interest? Well, it can enhance private property as long as it doesn't take too much of it, right? It can contribute to capitalism. It can contribute to capitalism. So there are purposes, you know, although I would argue this, you know, why should the government be in charge of it, especially the federal government? Who, who should be in charge of, for example, building streets for commerce? The cities. The states or cities or counties, right? That's the way it is. Not the federal government. Now, the federal government, say, could build highway systems, which they have. But the message or the point that has got to be made is whether you have an opinion one way or the other, whether you think that the government should use compelling force to take money to give to other people or not use for private property, I can't prove that. I can, I can tell you that I can legally do it. We do it all the time now, right? We compel by force for you to give money to people that don't do anything, right? Mm -hmm. But I can't prove that that is a legitimate purpose of government. My only point to you is I can prove what a legitimate purpose of government is, and that is to tax for the protection of private property. And that's it. Next week, we'll go into, no, not, or next week, we won't be here, but we'll talk about responsibly self-efficient defense and um, forgiveness. So we're actually moving a little bit, still, still touching private property, but this is an important point in issues. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you just look after us this week. Take care of us all. In your name we would pray. Amen.